During the early months of 538, while the Siege of Rome was nearing its conclusion, the Bishop of Mediolanum, Dacius, arrived in the Eternal City, leading a delegation. They sought an audience with Belisarius, and promised him that with some military support, Mediolanum and the entire region of Liguria could be secured for the Eastern Roman Empire. Belisarius agreed to send troops northward, but he would wait until after Rome was completely secured from the Ostrogoths. When the siege ended in the spring of 538, Belisarius dispatched an army under Mundulus, Enes, and Paulus towards Genoa by sea, with their goal being to move on to Mediolanum after landing. When the men reached Genoa, they disembarked and brought their smaller boats ashore with them, carrying them inland on wagons as they marched. They did this because they knew that they would need to cross the Po River, and wanted to be able to do so as quickly and easily as possible. The army did not meet any resistance until after crossing the river when they approached Ticinum. This city was defended by a large garrison, and the Ostrogoths had large amounts of money and resources within the city's walls. The two sides met in a fierce battle outside the city, with the Romans forcing the Ostrogoths into retreat. The Ostrogoths managed to get back inside the city's walls, just ahead of the pursuing Romans, barely being able to close the gates behind them. Mundulus did not attempt to breach the walls, but instead continued his march towards Mediolanum. When he reached the city, the inhabitants threw open the gates and gleefully welcomed the Eastern Roman army inside. Shortly after, other towns in Liguria followed suit, namely Bergamum, Comum, and Novaria. Dacius had been correct. The entire region was now under Eastern Roman control. Mundulus garrisoned men in each of these towns, leaving only a small force with him in Mediolanum. Vitiges was quick to act on this threat to northern Italy. He had already lost much of the south, and he knew that he could not afford to let Mediolanum go. He sent his nephew, Arias, to win the territory back. As the Ostrogothic army approached Mediolanum from the south, a new threat arose in the northwest. Theudebert and the Franks were about to make their move. Theudebert was smart, though. He had previously agreed not to side with the Ostrogoths, and was not prepared to tear up his deal with Justinian. So instead of sending Frankish men south, he sent Burgundians, a people that had been subjected by the Franks in 534. The idea here was that Theudebert had an out. If Justinian complained, Theudebert could always say that the Burgundians had acted on their own and not on his orders. This was the same basic logic that he used when he sent the Suevi to aid Vitiges when the Ostrogoths moved into Dalmatia in 537. So when Urias's men arrived at Mediolanum, they were joined by a huge Burgundian army that had totally crossed the Alps of its own free will and was absolutely not acting on the orders of the Frankish king. I'm sure that the Romans took some solace in that fact while they were surrounded by a far superior force. Unlike at the Siege of Rome, the Ostrogoths had enough men to completely surround Mediolanum. This was bad news for the Roman defenders. Mundulus resorted to enlisting the city's citizens to help with the defenses. Word got back to Belisarius that the city was in peril, and he sent troops under Martinus and Uliaris to break the siege. This was the same Martinus that played a major role in the siege of Ariminum, by the way. Martinus and Uliaris camped south of the Po River, and took their time formulating a plan. And I mean they really took their time. 
they took so long that Mundulus sent Paulus to sneak through the enemy lines, swim across the Po, meet with the generals, and implore them to hurry up. Martinus and Uliaris agreed, and Paulus made the daring trip back to Mediolanum to inform everyone that help was on its way. Except that help was not on its way. Mundulus and Uliaris stayed south of the Po for weeks before determining that they could not safely cross and engage the enemy. They wrote to Belisarius, telling him that they would need reinforcements, and asked for John and Justinus to join them. These two men were now in Amelia, and Belisarius wasted no time sending them orders to move ahead to reinforce Martinus and Uliaris. But John and Justinus refused to obey the order. They responded that they would only move if Narses issued the command. The power dispute that had arisen between Narses and Belisarius during the siege of Ariminum was now threatening to derail the entire campaign. I mean, look at this. Belisarius is here, but he can't get help to his men here unless he gets Narses, who is here, to order these guys here to move. And all this while these guys over here desperately need help. It's just a mess. But Belisarius still tried. He immediately told Narses that he needed to order John and Justinus to reinforce Martinus and Oliaris. Narses agreed, and finally the wheels were turning. But while preparing to cross the Po, John came down with an illness that delayed the whole operation. Procopius gives no indication that this might have been faked. John was apparently quite sick. It was just bad luck. But after the delay in getting the reinforcements in action to begin with, this wasn't something that the defenders of Mediolanum could overcome. The combined Ostrogothic Burgundian forces had been besieging the city for over six months at this point. The city's supplies were depleted. Procopius says that inside the city, they were eating dogs and mice and whatever animals they could get their hands on. They couldn't wait any longer. They simply had nothing left. Knowing that the situation inside Mediolanum was grim, the Ostrogoths sent envoys to Mundulus, offering to spare his army if he were to surrender the city. Mundulus asked that the citizens of Mediolanum also be spared any retribution. But this was not something that the Ostrogoths could accept. Mundulus, nobly, did not want to save himself and his men while leaving the citizens of the city to suffer. He attempted to rally his men to one last charge. For when men have once entered life, a single fate is advancing upon all of them, to die at the appointed time. But as to the manner of death, men differ, for the most part, from one to the other. And there is this difference, that cowards, as one might expect, in every case, first bring upon themselves insult and ridicule from their enemies, and then, at the exact time previously appointed, fulfill their destiny no whit the less. But it falls on the lot of noble men to suffer this with valor, and an abundance of goodly fame. And apart from these considerations, if it had been possible to become slaves of the barbarians, and at the same time to save the people of the city, that at least might have brought us some forgiveness for saving ourselves so disgracefully. But if, in fact, we are bound to look on while such a great multitude of Romans is being destroyed by the hand of the enemy, this will be more bitter than any form of death of which a man could tell. 
for we should appear to be doing nothing more or less than helping the barbarians to perpetuate this dreadful deed. While, therefore, we are sufficiently our own masters to adorn necessity with valor, let us make glorious the fortune which has fallen upon us. And I say that we ought all to arm ourselves in the best possible manner and advance upon the enemy when they are not expecting us. For the result for us will be one of two things. Either fortune will have wrought for us in some way a success which transcends our present hope, or we, in achieving a happy end, shall have rid ourselves of our present troubles with the fairest fame. But sadly, the men had already suffered enough. Despite Mundulus's efforts, they chose not to fight and accepted the terms offered by the Ostrogoths. After Mediolanum fell, the rest of Liguria again followed suit. The small Roman garrisons also surrendered and retreated back towards Rome. The Ostrogoths were true to the terms of the agreement. They did not harm the Romans on their retreat. All of their fury would be turned on Mediolanum. The city was razed, and the punishment for allying with the Romans was severe. The city's Praetorian prefect was torn to pieces and fed to dogs. The men were slaughtered, 300,000 of them, according to Procopius. The women were enslaved, and many of them were turned over to the Burgundians as payment for their services. This was a terrible fate for Mediolanum, and it resulted in no small part from the dissension within the Roman ranks. The power struggle at the top had led directly to pain and loss and suffering on a massive scale.